I uploaded a video today about responsibility, about um, walking with God moment by moment. I've been thinking a lot about violence and grace. In other words, like the grace of God, but also like the force necessary to curb sin. I don't know. I've been thinking about, um, I don't know, but I uploaded a little five minute segment of, you know, it's funny. I was, uh, going through my YouTube feed and your video came up, it came up in the feed and I didn't even know it was yours. I thought it was someone else's corny Jesus video. And I was like, eh, not interested. So I swiped by it. But now I'm going to the manual override podcast site, the the subscription site. And I'm like, Oh, that was his podcast podcast that was his episode that's funny (laughs) oh my gosh (laughs) well no i i um i did that little video just because i was thinking today about um i was thinking about like how in all the years prior in my life i'd always felt like a victim in life like i just had to you know god had to set me free from my problems and now i'm like this year i'm like no i'm responsible i'm taking authority or i'm taking accountability for it i'm acknowledging when i do something wrong before god but it's not an issue of salvation and it's amazing how how often on like facebook i just i'm a part of like like the soteriology 101 group chat and even there i'm like oh my goodness like people can just be so nasty on both sides like i i'm not even you know it's interesting that group is has not historically been that way it has only gotten that way in the past, I don't know, nine months to a year. Yeah. It used to be it used to be really civil, and then a bunch of people from outside groups started joining, uh, who were maybe more reformed or Calvinist, and then and then what happened was a lot of the people in the group were like, oh, we have like, we have this understanding, we can refute the Calvinists now. Now that we know that they're wrong, it's like all out war. You know what I mean? There's like. It's this this yeah. knowledge that puffs up, and then they know that they're right, but they don't handle it well, and they lose their I, minds, and then they start attacking, you know, ad hominem. It's just nasty. I was, I mean, I'm not even a, I may be non-Calvinistic, but I like most of my friends are Calvinists, like, and I don't, and, and like they're gonna not, need to find some new friends. Well, boy. no, no, no. Here, here's the thing, Andrew. I I don't have a problem with people being Calvinistic if they at least understand like how it can be like, I theologically think that when you follow that system all the way through, it's not, it doesn't lead to good places. But I also think that people just don't know. They understand God's sovereign and they want peace in life and they want to understand and rest in the promises of God. And so, you know, there are things in theology that are hard to understand. And I was telling Jared, one of my friends, who's very Calvinistic and he's one of my best friends. And I'm like, he's really like as Calvinistic as he gets, but we've had some great discussions. And I think we've both like smoothed each other out over the years, you know, about like, like he's definitely more open to some of the things I like that I say and I to him, but, and I told him like, I don't want people to be non Calvinistic. I I want them to at least like entertain, like I, I don't seek agreement. I seek understanding. Like, I want them to understand why I think the way I think. And I want to understand why they think the way they do and still be brothers in Christ at the end of the day. Like, I don't need them to say, hey, Robert, because I see this, like, huge dichotomy. I'm like, be a Calvinist, but understand where, like, hey, maybe my theology might not, you know, be where it might not be helpful or it might be misunderstood or or at least understand the shortcomings of it. Like, and, and, like, I, I think there's a place for, like, you know, theological, like, disagreement on a higher level but i also know that there's a lot of calvinists that aren't like they don't understand why others are so against it because they might not have seen the same abuses you know how things can be abused so i i really advocate and daniel's really like that too you know my friend and so it's just really i can i can i jump on oh yeah please yeah i definitely agree with that i think my my big motivator in trying to wrestle through the issues of reform theology and Calvinism and even Arminianism and, and things like that is because people don't take it to this, to its logical end, Hmm. the, the theological premises and presuppositions. Okay. If God is totally sovereign, it does really uh, decree certain things that has implications down the road for other people in their salvation. Hmm. How do we interpret that in light of certain scripture passages? And honestly, I found some of the evidence for, for Calvinism lacking. That's Mm. why I didn't settle on it. I wrestled with it, but I didn't settle on it. I think the same can be said for um, Arminian interpretations of 
uh, like Romans nine, it didn't, it didn't sit right. It wasn't mm. adequate. It wasn't a sufficient explanation or refutation even of the Calvinist interpretation. Not until hmm, maybe a couple of years ago, year, year ago now at this point, yeah. when I stumbled across Leighton Flowers and his interpretations, did I kind of come to an, a, a, a better understanding and uh, he, he kind of opened an avenue that hadn't really been opened to my understanding before. And I'm not saying he's the first one who pioneered this, uh, pioneered, um, sure, you know, yeah. a, a new interpretation, but he's the one who presented it that I found. And so that opened my eyes and I'm like, okay, I'm not an Arminian. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm neither. There's a third option. And that's the false dichotomy because yeah, Arminianism uses point. presuppositions from Calvinism and they both are off on the wrong foot. Both, Does that make sense? And both lead to like a lordship salvation if you're not careful, which is interesting because, you know, Arminians will say you lost your salvation. And I, I do believe in the doctrine of eternal security, but both I would I would say, um, you know, fall fall into those categories. So I, and I, I just think that's interesting. I mean, regardless of that. Um, oh, and by the way, this is manual override our podcast. Let's introduce this at some point. But I, I think we're just going to probably do a ramble thing tonight about theology. And um, I know that what's been close to my heart is rightly seeing God as he reveals himself. And that's kind of what Andrew and what we've been talking about. Uh, really, our friendship over the years has really been about, like, who is God? What is he really like? Um, how might How can we understand his love rightly how can we understand his sovereignty rightly you know his omni benevolence with his all powerfulness and you know especially when we talk about calvinism and stuff like this one thing i've seen stressed in just the christian circles that i've been in, that i think you've been in is like we know the three omnis of god right all powerful all knowing what's one all all you know omni uh omni or no omnipresent all, all, all omnipresent omnipresent omniscient omnipresence and omnipotence i really see those all as just omnipotence because they're just have to do with power you know the power to be anywhere the power to know everything but one thing that i do not think that we stress enough is his omnibenevolence his all goodness you know praise the lord for he is good you know and so you know when you <laughs> i remember when i was going through some hard times you know <laughs> one of my friends actually apologized the other day because i was going through a really hard time and he was saying you know, I really said some mean things to you, kind of in lieu of his Calvinistic. He's like, you don't under, you don't, you know, believe God is sovereign, or you don't, you know, fear the Lord the right way. And he said something to this extent mm -hmm. to me when I was really in a hard place. And I remember the Holy Spirit kind of being there in that moment, saying, "Don't get mad at him. It's okay." Like, you know, and, and <clears throat> I remember he recently said something to me. He's like, "You know, I was wrong of me to say that to you." And it's interesting because, you know, he may see God in a more Calvinistic sovereignty way than I do. Not that I we, I, we might understand it differently, but we, I think we were still trying to grasp it like, you know, how do we deal with suffering? How do we deal with a God who says he's all good and yet is all powerful? You know, and it's funny because uh, the Batman versus Superman movie that I, I always would mention that because there's this scene where Lex Luthor says to like, I think it was Batman or Superman. He's like, you know, how can God be all good or all powerful? And, you know, it's, that's like, that's like kind of what this all comes down to in, in many ways is, is our lack of human understanding. But Andrew, yeah, I. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about a Facebook group that we're both a part of, um, on and it's just it's just interesting to see how. I mean, we see people just argue, and like bite and devour other Christian brothers and sisters who I believe are saved, but we're just arguing and arguing, and it, it, I mean, it, and it makes it almost hard to actually come to truth because people are so concerned about their party lines, right, Andrew? I mean, it's just yeah. like, and even with us, like we, like I disagree with things that you believe or some of my other friends, and it's okay, you can still, I mean, isn't that kind of the theme of the country yeah, right sure. now? Yeah, yeah, very, very much divided. Um, I I realized I, I didn't come into this fight with any sort of, uh, I, I forget the phrase, with any sort of uh, aside, you know, I, I, yeah. um, I, I came to Moody and they were teaching systematics from a reformed Baptist position, which included Calvinism and those sorts of interpretations of Romans and Ephesians. And I, I was like, okay, what do I do with this? I, I need to understand this. I need to respond to this. Uh, but something didn't sit right. And I think it's because mm -hmm. 
when I was born again, I had this really impactful encounter of God and his love and what he felt for me, I experienced when I was born again Mm -hmm. in May of 2014. And I knew that he had that same desire, not just for me, but for the world. The world. Yeah. And I couldn't, yeah, I mean, like I couldn't let that go. I couldn't let not, it's not just a feeling it's backed up by scripture. And I think when we, we forget that God really does love the world. It's not how the Calvinist presents it. And I'm not bashing Calvinism. I'm not saying that. I just think there's a, there's, there's a reinterpretation that kind of goes on like, like a little bit, like like how we understand love. I think what I'm getting at more is like, what I'm getting at is you can, you can teach a systematic, but it's just a knowledge sort of, it's a head knowledge. It's not an internalized truth. There are different types of knowing things. There's like, there's head knowledge, then there's heart and muscle memory knowledge sort of things. And then there's like experiential knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and knowing Christ, being known by Christ, as First Corinthians talks about, First Corinthians 13, you know, the love passage. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. this is kind of a tangent. I've been doing a little, uh, a little bit of a dive into that the past week and a half. Um, I think the gain is too high. I'm going to turn it down That's a little. Okay. Um, that passage talks about that passage talks about love, obviously, and Christians like to point to it to say, "Oh, God, God is loving." But really, if you look at the last few verses, it talks about when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child. But when I uh, became a man, I put away childish things. Mm-hmm. Uh, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, but face then to face. we will be seen or then we will see face to face and know yeah. and be fully known if you if you line up the loving characteristics in contrast with the non-loving characteristics the loving characteristics all describe aspects of god that's what god is I mean, it when says scripture god, says is, god love. is love exactly it really does mean exactly that. yep and then you look at the the other characteristics of what love is not and they're all worldly is characteristics proud, human is, fleshly yeah, characteristics is, yeah. well I've been thinking of that in relation to the last few verses, knowing and being known and seeing fully when the perfect comes, that's talking about Christ. Okay. I'll tell you like it, it's almost that whole passage is almost talking about the person of Christ. We will know him and be fully known by him. You know, we see him in a, in a mirror dimly through his attributes and through how he takes care of us as Christians. But then when we are glorified, we will know him fully and deeply and truly. And I think, I mean, this isn't like an arrogant stance I'm taking. I just really had a deep connection with, with the Lord when he saved me, when he raised me from the dead, I felt that maybe a little bit more deeply, you know, some, yeah, I'm not, I'm not bragging, you know, some have different gifts. Some have, some have faith. Some have uh, hospitality, some have uh, teaching, some there are different measures of different things. And yeah. I think maybe I was fortunate enough to see or feel and experience a, a greater measure of God's love. I think it probably has to do with, um, you know, what I came out of. It was a, it was a very dark period of my life uh, for many, many years. Mm. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not that I'm bashing Calvinism. I just think there's a disconnect between the love aspect and the logical conclusions of where they want to take their systematic. Mm. Um, the gears. It's a long, long tangent. No, no, but. no. Uh, yeah, you can turn the gain up a little bit if you want, by the way. But um, yeah, because it was just a little lower. But okay. Andrew, that um, that I think that's the key. There was. It's like when you don't like it's un like what was it? There's like known knowns, known unknowns, unknown unknowns. When we were first studying theology, there were so many unknown unknowns. And and when you when God is presented to you in an, in only one way, like God knows what whatever we go on to do. My goal is, I want to teach people what I think is a correct view, but I also want to at least lay out like, hey, this is what other people think. And if and if you want to explore that, go ahead. I, I might try sure. to point out some of the shortcomings. But I remember when I was at Moody, kind of just 
which I think is a great school, by the way, but when sure. certain aspects of Calvinism were brought out, their logical conclusions, which a lot of people wrestled with, were never explicitly dealt with in class. And there were many students who I talked with, who I spoke with, who, who said, this is not the God I know. Yeah. You know, back home, my church in Mexico, you know, this loving God, this this God of Calvinism is different. There's something different. Now, oh, you go to the, the buffet of theology and pick and choose what you want. But what I realize I think that is, is that's the Holy Spirit inside of us, maybe pricking us saying, hey, uh, keep studying, keep keep pressing on. There's something here. And that's where things are very subjective. But I think that that leads you to go and to say, okay, well, what does the Bible say? You know, and I think it's interesting because, you know, Paul Washer gets accused of, oh, that's not my, people will stand up and yell at Paul Washer. That's not my God. And then he'll say, you create a God in your own image who caters to your emotions. God is, you know, he has wrath towards sin and this and that. And I was like, okay, everyone, let's calm down. <laughs> let's not create a God in our own image, number one. Let's, let's really seek who is Jesus? Who is God? Who has he revealed himself to be? But I think what that illustration, that issue is pointing out is, you know, so many people don't like, they don't know that, hey, um, like I, I say, at least what we dealt with, sometimes people's, sometimes you're being fed a theology and a philosophy. And I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's so important to to go to the Bible itself and, and to wrestle with it. It is difficult. It is hard to deal with sometimes, but it's so important to like deal with those passages. And that's something it's so crazy. That love passage yeah. that you brought up. Like I had a, uh, my, um, uh, my stepdad's doing like a, like a counseling, biblical counseling thing. And it was amazing because his teacher said something that I like had thought about, but no pastor had ever told me God is love. Let's go right to, uh, what is it? First Corinthians chapter 13, which is a love chapter. Love is not proud. Love is not boastful. Love is this. Love is that. And I was like, can you actually apply those to God? Because I'd go to some of the theologians at Moody and say, hey, is God proud? Is God selfish? At PLM where I was at, I mean, I was, I, you know, I, I was almost wondering, is God like the overboss who can break anyone he wants because he, you know, Isaiah says, you know, he shares his glory with no one? Or what if we are misunderstanding God so foundationally that pride and selfishness is literally something he isn't oh wait a minute that's what that's what corinthians says love is not proud love is not self-seeking so when god has to break nebuchadnezzar or bring you know something into someone's life to humble them god forbid that you know they aren't listening otherwise because he i do believe god does that but it's for a reason it's because we are behaving like satan the antithesis of who jesus is who god is and we look at the cross yeah god himself the fullness of God was pleased to dwell bodily in Christ. We're talking about the whole fullness of God. Yeah. So, and that's a whole discussion there. But I the mean, the point, cross is an, is, an, yeah. is a picture of the love of God. It's the extent to which he will go the because humility. he loves humanity. Yeah, the humility that God himself, I mean, the humiliation that he goes through on behalf of man. Yeah. You know Despising I mean? the shame, looking forward to the glory that is fixed before him. Yeah. Someone was saying, you know, that angels have a theology, you know, and God was, you know, there are things angels are, the angels are created beings, but they also have, you know, they're, they're sentient. They, and he said that they don't understand grace, but they look at humans. I forgot what he was pulling from. He said, you know, things that angels long to look into. And he's talking about grace. I, I think that's what this. Uh, Hebrews? This, is that I, Hebrews? I, I, it might be in Hebrews. I don't remember where, where that verse is. I, I think it is Hebrews. First but, few chapters. But, but it's interesting because they don't, redemption is not given to them. I mean, given they were there at the creation of the world, but the point is, is that they can see God's redemptive nature in humanity yeah. where he yeah. has done this. So it's, it's interesting that there's a lot going on and, um, yeah, but I, yeah, maybe pivoting a little bit. I just, I, I just remember, can I, yeah, sorry. go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to touch on a point before we get too far away go from ahead. what you said. You mentioned it's, a, uh, um, we are taught, like a philosophy and a and a theology. What was that? What was that yeah, point? Yeah, I, w- I was I was talking about how like you know the Calvinism, at least all the five points of Tulip, for example, they they flow philosophically and they you know especially right. the limited atonement. That's just not right. biblical. You know, you really have to do some gymnastics to get that to fit. Sure. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, I think I think the reason uh, the reason some people like myself included, I'm not throwing anyone under the bus that yeah. I wouldn't. Be 
driven over myself. Uh, some of the passages like Ephesians and like Romans, those are hard passages. Mm -hmm. Those are hard to exegete. Those are hard to understand if you don't have wisdom, if you don't have deep biblical understanding and people just kind of let it wash over them. And it happens bit by bit here and there, you know, God is sovereign. Yeah, I agree with that. God is sovereign. I define it differently though. And most people don't think they don't pause to think, Oh yeah. Okay. Does sovereignty mean God, God is in control of the universe and can do whatever he pleases? Or does it mean that he is in control of every minute detail and event and circumstance that happens? And he decreed it from before the foundations of the earth. That's, that's a, it's a, it's a I, I get, I get what you're getting at though. Yeah, you know what it, I mean? It's, it's like th these yeah. passages are hard that, you know, I wrestled with them for four years before I had any sort of deep insight. Mm-hmm. But it just takes time. It takes time. And most people aren't patient enough or stick around long enough. And again, it probably sounds like we're railing specifically on the whole church and most of American churches, but that's not really the case. I'm, I'm not there are, trying to do that. And that's the thing. I mean, you know, I have a great pastor I listen to down in Texas, um, Andy Woods, and he'll say the same thing. You know, he's he is saying, you know, it is a false overemphasis of God's sovereignty. That's what Calvinism is. And he's very clear about it. This is the president of Schaefer Theological Institute saying this. So he's like, you know, there are many people out there who are, are and that's the thing. It's, it just seems that every which way I turn, it seems like everyone, it's simple. God's sovereign. I'm the puppet. You know, it, and I think what we're doing is we're applying really a human and dare I say almost a satanic idea of power. Because if Satan had all the power, he would is he is a puppet master. He is controlling sure. people. He is manipulative. Yeah. But God, and, that, and I think this comes down to the Garden of Eden. And dare I say, this is going to be a little bit of a tangent, but um, you know, and it's interesting when I was at the Ark, Ken Ham would say this: the foundations, the way you understand Genesis, sets up the rest of the Bible. Mm. I'll be a, people of different interpretations of all that, but I'll, I'll give you yes. this. This is this blew my mind, but essentially, when God, Adam and Eve were in the garden, it was a probationary period. At the end of the book, we're in a city. At the beginning of the book, we're in, in a garden. Why? Because there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Why is that there? Because God created sentient beings in the image of God, which includes us being able to reject him. There has to be an avenue of rebellion for us to have real choice, real sure. free will. Oh, God is sovereign before the foundations of the earth. Okay, let's pause. What's God doing? He's showing us that we have will, that we have yeah. the ability to, to not love him. Love involves a choice. I mean, and this is very simple, but yet it's, you know, we can, can we can miss this. And this is, I think, what we're getting at with why we wrestle with Calvinism, yeah. because it destroys, I mean, it destroys love. But but I just want to end it. Yeah. That what's interesting, though, is um, this shows you the love relationship God wants with us. So we yeah. see how Calvin, Calvinism critiques this. And if I could go f a step further satanic and occult groups, dare I say Freemasons, have their own interpretation of Genesis 2. They believe, you know, Satan's the Prometheus liberating them from God. And look at how that theology, yes, satanic Luciferian theology, has imp impacted, you know, people, you know, these occult groups' hatred of God. So, and that's, and I mm. think that's very interesting because what you do with Genesis affects what you do with God. What is God doing? And, and, and if it's, God wants a love relationship yeah. with his creation, so... Yeah, I've heard people say that if you if you knock off the bookends of the Bible, no one will believe what's even in the middle, yeah. you know? So, like, if you take out Genesis, if you take out Revelation, all the stuff in between is useless anyways. Um, mm. Yeah, there was, um, there was a point that I, I thought, but I, I've lost my train of thought. Sorry. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, it takes away, you know, a, a lack of choice, real, genuine, free will choice takes away not only... Uh, the capacity for real genuine love, uh, but also it, it totally negates any moral responsibility or culpability that mm. we have as sinners. Yeah, we're sinners, but why are we sinners? Which is why I struggled so long with, you know, addiction and these things. I was like, I'm just a pawn, you know? Yeah. But exactly that. Yeah, it's, take, it's yeah. are you, some, some sinners are worse than others, but are there, those... There are degrees of sin. There are degrees of sin. There's punishment. degrees of sin, but also, like, are some people just predestined to be sinners, and that's that. Then they have... They, what better excuse do they have for saying to God on Judgment Day, I literally couldn't do anything about this, but I'm going to hell because you predestined me to hell? And God would say, yeah, who are you, oh man? That, that seems like a faulty systematic. That seems like it's just lazy theology to me, but... Yeah, no, I, that's exactly it. Is is it's interesting because 
you see it through um, uh, scientific naturalism and you see it through hyper-Calvinism, the removal of responsibility. Now, hyper-Calvinism doesn't necessarily remove it, but in a very theological sense it does. Because it's Explain like, that. What do you mean? Well, like, okay, so, so naturalism says all of your choices are predetermined biochemically by chemicals in your brain. So if you're an addict and you're, you have a disease and this and that and this and that, but when it comes to Calvinism, you have you have a um it essentially seems like you have a system that again god has to be the domino f- the one who flicks the first domino of evil and that's kind of how it's described i think wayne grudem you know he kind of you know they semantically mm-hmm. get yeah. around it i mean because you know there's no darkness in god but to fit the system you know again it's that view view of sovereignty but what i'm saying is is you know especially the deterministic sort of outcomes yeah. i know i know a lot of naturalistic scientists believe in sort of a, a biological determinism. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. And that, um, <sighs> it's the outcome of the universe. That's how it's fate. That's fate how it's going to be fate. It's just, you know, I, I, I mean, it is, you're not wrong. It is a sort of pseudo, hmm, I don't know if it's paganism, but it's, it's almost I, I, rooted I, I, in, Gnosticism, but it's the fate. It's just chance, you know. And you even look back in some of these these religious these these you know pagan. I call it that because it's just you know the yeah, the, yeah. the fate is really what's got like like think about it. Oh, that that's an amazing coincidence. You know, I I always see this weird thing when you see the miraculous in life. Do you attribute it to a coincidence or do you attribute it to God? Mm. And I will say, like, there have been too many coincidences for me to say that it's not the hand of God. It is the hand of God. I've seen it. Enough is enough. I'm not going to, you know, but it's interesting. Whenever something big happens in my life that seems like, wow, that's a really odd circum like series of events. Was it fate? And so it's kind of like, I, I see that, you know, in, in like a naturalistic way, we could attribute it to that. But, um, mm. you know, but, but God, again, holding it, it's resp- what I'm trying to get. It's responsibility at the end of the day. Like when it comes down to sin, you know, you look at AA groups, sex, sexaholics, anonymous, whatever it, you have a disease, you have this. By the way, it's interesting when I went to those groups, the minute you take Jesus out, there's no power for change. There's there's power for, for behavior modification, but there's no sure. you know, and I just remember No, this. I definitely agree. But yeah. you know that but like like I have the most healing in my life from my own struggles and things like that, um, is when I just acknowledge it. Like, hey, I confess my sin before God, which means to acknowledge, hey God, this is wrong. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I want fellowship with you. I acknowledge that this isn't right. But that doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with my salvation. But again, it just it, it it brings me back into intimacy and fellowship with God, but um, but it's interesting because you know with with I just remember years and years and years of just like being a puppet on a string, being so depressed because God, when will I be set free from my sin? When will I be Robert? The choice is yours. You know, understanding the bema seat judgment of Christ too. I think Reformed theology actually kind of shoves everyone at the great white throne judgment at the end. I believe First Corinthians chapter three talks about the bema seat judgment of christ which is again there's levels of hell right there's levels of reward god wants to reward you You know if a man's work be burned up wood haints double that's not or but yet he will be saved that's not talking about purgatory that's what the catholics use i think but um you know it's talking about rewards which means that you know or the crown of life you know so i'm it's just interesting because like your your system of theology we're kind of going all over the place but your system of theology really uh, impacts i think if that's what i want to get across people is why do me and Andrew care about Calvinism? Andrew Why, and I. Thank you. Thank you. For that. <laughs> Why do we care about this? Well, I was not opposed to Calvinism, I'd say, half a year ago, but I had an experience with a group that kind of worked with the, you know, that system, and it was, mm. you know, it just, it's it's not helpful. It's not true. The, the issue is it's not an issue of God's sovereignty as much as it is of how when you overemphasize something, it spider webs or the gears all, it, you need a different machine for all the gear system. The system works differently if you change this piece a little bit. So, sure. you know, you have a car engine, all the pieces work together. If you change one piece, you got to change some other pieces. And yeah. That's kind of how this works. Um, thus, systematic theology, right? This piece, this gear affects this gear. So, um, yeah. Y- yeah, but you- go ahead. Uh, you just jumping back to a point. Um, I forget what your point was, but it made me think of Isaiah 55, 6, which happens to be the verse of the day. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I think this was the, the you were talking about choices and confessing your sins yeah. and that sort of thing. There is a, there isn't, the act, the, the burden is on the individual. That passage in the Old Testament in Isaiah makes it clear that's just one passage where it's clearly on the individual yeah. to respond, to repent, to it, it's the individual is morally responsible for their guilt, for their sin. God didn't determine them to sin. It says, and the, uh, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him do that. He should do that. I'm not going to force him to do that. He should do that on his own. Okay. I can't push him into that because then I would be involved in making him make that decision pro or against. It's interesting. Yeah. It, it's like, there's a couple of thoughts going through my head, but it's like, God's not going to believe for you. And some people read, you know, Ephesians, the gift of faith, you know, again, feminine neuter, those, those things don't align. That's very important because I was reading a Facebook post on that soteriology thing. And this lady's like, you know, if you could choose heaven or hell, then you made the choice. So it ends there. You know, God is sovereign. Either you're going to understand it's a gift or not, you know, and it's so it got into that. And I'm like, that that's not that's not how that works. You know, it's it's and, and that's the hard thing is, is we've we've it's like we understand God is all powerful. But we haven't like fleshed that out. Like, what does that mean? How does that incorporate our moral responsibility before God? And then you start dealing with like justice and heaven and hell and like me and daniel were talking about like you know like capital punishment and like temporal consequences to sin yet being justified and going to heaven you know like how do you deal with all that when it's just like it, things get very complicated very quickly but like i just it, it's just very interesting because if you don't yeah. understand your your human responsibility your agency like like when i understood that yeah i, I have a soul that literally can choose to hate god or choose to love him based on, but here's the thing based on his, I'd say again, the Holy spirit convicts the world. So, the, so God comes to us first and he comes to the whole world. John 10, 16, 16, 10, I think, you know, he, you know, spirit convicts the world and it's specifically the sin of unbelief. But again, I have the ability to respond that like that makes sense because I, I literally would go around living my life where I thought if you just said the right words, you could get like, it was very manipulative. Like people are just kind of like machines, you know, I'm a machine. You're a machine. We all, you know, like we just are biochemical. I was very naturalistic in my thinking, but it's interesting how Calvinism, like in a strange sense, like it, it's almost like case Sarah, Sarah, like whatever will be, will be, you know, the future is not ours to see. It's a song, <laughs> um, but you know, and we just, it, it, you know, and it comes across as faith, and that's what it is in many cases. But, but it also can become like this lack of, like, hey, if I keep sinning, if I keep looking, I'll give you an example. If I keep looking at pornography, I will forfeit my reward in heaven. Do you hear them talk like that? Or are we always talk about the great white throne judgment. It's all by grace. The Lord set me free from my addiction. Yeah, He did. But guess what? You utilize that power. And I'll give you an example. Um. Oh man, I'm losing my train of thought. But yeah, like the great, like like the crown of life. I, you know, the one who who ugh. people need, like the beam, the judgment of Christ. Like understanding that you can stand before God, justified, but not have walked into everything that He had for you. It says that He, you know, we are saved by faith. You know, ugh. good works. It's in Ephesians. He has prepared good works that we should walk into them. It's 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 like the the possible the mood of possibility yeah. you know yeah. so you see that there is a possibility for you to forfeit the things or we talk about you know first corinthians chapter three the carnal christian so you know i cannot regard you as spiritual but as worldly you know you're you're bringing each other up before judges don't you know that you'll judge angels you know he's he's reminding them of who they are called to be or it says in ephesians i think it says or Thess thessalonians i think first thessalonians you know walk worthy of the calling and it says in galatians too walk worthy of the calling to which you're called you know um these are all very important choices so so in this and i remember talking to my roommate at moody um four years ago very Calvinistic. And he, he was more open to there being choices post salvation, but you know, God elects those who are actually saved, you know, prior, but it all comes down to responsibility. 
Are you going to respond to God for salvation when he calls you, when he is convicting you? You know, oh, well, God only calls some people. No, it literally says the Holy Spirit convicts the whole world. Jesus says, when the Son of Man lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. So, you know, and I would even say pre-Christ, you still have the same God working, going to Nineveh. I mean, how many things were not recorded, I sometimes wonder. You know, God is reaching out to the world. The whole point of him working through Israel was to bless the whole world. God is trying to redeem all of mankind, but he is never... He is never going against his design, the image of God design, which involves a choice, a, a choice of the soul, volition of the soul, volition. And so, um, yeah, you know, and I, again, so I, I guess we're kind of just rambling all over the place, but again, it, it has, this There's has some thoughts. Yeah. And that's the point of this podcast is just, this has, I, I hope people will see that this has, cause I keep talking to all my friends, all of my friends that are just kind of in Bible college. They're just Calvinistic because that's what they're taught. And it makes sense. And I kind of wrestled with it. But, you know, God's sovereign, God's sovereign. That's it, the thing. They say it makes sense. But why do we say that it doesn't make sense? It Because the way that it, it makes sense because the philosophy that starts with T, total depravity, the way that they define deadness is the main issue. Okay, so they all fall. If if your deadness means you're completely unable to respond to God, then all the the pieces of tulip fall into place. Deadness does not mean what they mean, think it means. God, yeah. no no one seeks God, no not one. You're right, but guess who seeks man? The Holy Spirit will convict the whole world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The sin that they don't believe in me, righteousness because I go to be with my Father, and judgment because the rule of this world has been cast out. Okay, that's co- talking about the Holy Spirit convicting now you are able to respond romans one is about this too it talks about people who are given over to like a a, what is it a reprobate mind or whatever it's just like they they have given over to the desires of their yes yeah and it talks about sin these different sins and things like that but it's talking about people who have rejected natural revelation guess what did you know that you can respond to god's natural revelation it is not sufficient to save but when you do respond to it i've heard so many stories of god bringing special revelation through a missionary through a dream through this or that to save them which means that that islander who's over there who wasn't one of the elect you know oprah winfrey asked this once on on this tv show and the and she's like what about that islander and the lady in the cross says that doesn't matter it's you know it's jesus saves you know and i was like okay that's a really bad answer it really is because Oprah has a really good point and she just and all the people who are have their all the secular people with their thinking caps on are like, yeah, what about that person? Well, here's yeah. your answer. If they respond to God's natural revelation, guess what? All societies, all people groups have the Noahic Bible. When all of mankind came off of the flood, you won't hear this in school because evolution is God. But when all of mankind actually came off of the, the boat, Noah's Ark, they all possess the Noahic Bible, which is the We're revelation. Touching on some deep stuff. Yeah, well, which is the revelation of God from Genesis, in Genesis, really. And everyone had that. And you go back and you hear stuff from Nephilim, you hear global flood stories, you hear, you know, sons of God, intermarriage yep. between yep. the heavenly beings and man. You hear this in other cultures. However, the Holy Spirit wasn't present in those cultures to preserve it, such as it was in Israel. Okay, the Holy Spirit was in Israel preserving it. That's why we say the Bible's in error, you know, the sure. way they copy it, because we believe that God himself was there preserving at least one record through Israel that, that it, we have today is the Bible. But you go back and you see seed forms or, or connections of all of the same stuff. It's the Noahic Bible. So if people respond to that, the islander, God will bring them special revelation. God will make them because he loves the world. Okay, and I wrestled with that for a long time. And the best thing the Calvinist said to me was, well, they're just not elect. So they're just going to go to hell because everyone That's the logical it. conclusion and, of their of their presuppositions. Of their now, my big, yeah. my big issue is, and this is what I want to do a study on, is the theology of deserve. You, Everyone deserves hell. So, you know, don't ask questions. If they go to hell, they go to hell because everyone deserves hell. You know, so what if God passed over a few, you know, beggars? But he didn't then have to give we them come money. we come back to the to the passage of First Corinthians 13, the definition of love. If God is love and I'm not saying like. This isn't the cornerstone of an argument, but this is something that I think they forget about a lot. I know, I know what you're like, getting at. Yeah. If you want to be Bible focused, if you want to be a good exegete, if you want to be scriptural and biblical, don't you have to kind of weave this into your systematic? If this is the very nature of God, you have mm-hmm. to interpret passages like Ephesians one or Romans with with this in the back of your mind. You can't just ignore the fact that God does not seek said, his actually. own his yeah. own glory over the the over the benefit of the blessing of others, regardless of whether or not 
he is the supreme being you know the the unmoved mover the 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 most yeah. awesome holy separate person in and outside of creation what do, can just because he could do it does he do it you know no but why would he yeah. he can't because he is loving oh, because oh, he is omnibenevolent yeah. Yeah. he literally couldn't pass over people without giving them an option without giving them a possible means of escape you know what i mean it, that's what my one of the pastors i listened to he said he says you know god's sovereignty is never exercised or his election it's never exercised and he he he's yeah but he would say his election because he struggled with it too he was saying you know i do believe god ha- elects people but he I, I guess he would he's definitely not calvinistic at all but he says he never does anything without his omnibenevolence without in symphony with all of his other characteristics. So what, I mean, and that's essentially what he was saying was that, you know, does God choose? Do we choose? You know? And, and so he was saying that it's like, we got to at least see God as the full picture of who he is and that there are, there's a mystery to this. We see God, you know, reaching out saying, believe, what will you believe? You know, the one who believes, um, you know, and so it's just, and I appreciate that because that, and I think what we're addressing is, there are many people, theologians, who don't uh, talk that way, or 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 they're 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 very theological, but then they don't address those issues of the heart, which are like, well, what about that islander? What about that? You know, what if God is love? How does this make sense? And we're just told, just accept it. It's what we said is true. This is what the Bible teaches. Um, and then you know, there's and how many people have just been been you know I was, I was in the street evangelism thing, and, and this guy's like, I I mean, God never gave Judas a chance. He was an unbeliever, but he's like, how did God give? He never gave Judas a chance. You know, my 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 you know my Baptist friend said that um, you know, the message of Job is God can do whatever you he wants, and you just have to suck it up. And God is God. And and I realize, you know, and my Calvinistic friend said this. You know, we were reading the Quran together, and he said, you know, wow, God and Allah. You know, Muhammad seems to get a lot of things right about God. He says something like this, and he was really referring to God's sovereignty. And I was like, I was like, I knew you'd say that. Mm. Like, I just, like, I knew that as you were reading this, that's about weird. The power that's of really God, weird. And and it, because, and it's interesting. It's not that now. There's many things that they don't line up, but it's but essentially when you read the Quran, you have this like, you know, powerful God who does what He wants. He clearly is not a God of love. But it's interesting how I, I almost see a, a very a subtle parallel between dare I call it the God of Calvinism and the God of Islam, where it's, it's just a very powerful being. He's definitely not love in Islam. We call him a God of love in Christianity. Now they're obviously more, you know, dis, you know, dissimilarities than, than things that are similar. But I, I always found that interesting. Like it just, it it's almost like it's the same spirit behind it. Sometimes that's a yeah. big statement, but it, hey. I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I mean, I probably get a lot, a lot of hate mail for this, but I think, I think the God of Calvinism is just a Gnostic creation. So I, I, I mean, well, the whole Augustinian, like going back to Augustine, Gnosticism, Manichaeism sprang up in that part of the, in that part of the world, in that part of the globe. Uh, mm. Before Islam, before there Islam. was Gnosticism. Explain and that for people who don't know. part of the country. I'm not. I'm not familiar enough with it. Well, I'd have to brush up on like, it. But like basically, Calvin got a lot, most of his doctrine from Augustine. Calvin Augustine was in Africa, Calvin developed Africa. his doctrine from Augustine, Saint Augustine of Hippo, mm-hmm. uh, who was around in the three hundred third or fourth century, I think, uh, AD, and he was a he was a pagan. He was what was uh, called a Gnostic Manichaean. And originally, uh, originally, and then he converted to Christianity. Uh, But in his debates with um, the guy from England, that monk, uh, Pelagius, Pelagius, yeah, 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 yeah. In his debates with, he was the he was the super, you know, he's like the boogeyman of the the Dark Ages in the in the patristics. Um, Yeah, yeah. uh, it was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Anyways, uh, but he would debate. So Augustine, Augustine. uh, debated and wrote uh polemically against uh that that monk from england i I keep spacing on his name yeah pelagius so he wrote against him but in his writings he down the uh, maybe maybe 10 years or so after he he drew from a little bit of that like he did begin to dip back into he dipped back into the mindset of 
deterministic outcomes, which is a staple in Gnosticism. And uh, there's a guy, uh, Ken Wilson, uh, a lot of people love him. A lot of people hate him. Very polarized opinions on him, but he does an excellent job. I have his book. Was that? Okay. He does an excellent job in writing and uh, writing a thesis, basically proving that or explaining that Augustinian Exposing. Calvinism, Augustinian Calvinism yeah. is rooted in uh, Gnostic presuppositions. Gnostic. Okay. I, which I, is huge. That's that is, huge that is. because that tilts the whole system of Calvinism towards a false doctrine. And, and that's the thing. Most people that like, they're not, those like, are, those I'm, are heavy. That's a, yeah, that's a, that is, but drastic but, thing to but say, it, but you know what? I think it needs to be discussed because, and that's the thing. Like I'm not saying John Piper, or John MacArthur, or Paul Washer heretics. I believe they're saved by faith. They might not have the assurance of salvation that they actually should have, because they, you know, whatever, because of their system. But, you know, I, a lot of people follow them. A lot of people listen to them. I, in fact, I like a lot of what John Piper says. I was watch, listening to some of his stuff the other day. I was like, wow, he did an excellent job explaining that. But the problem is, is your system and yeah, how I other agree. people might abuse it. How, you know, there's areas of the system that you haven't maybe, like you have a position on it. But when it really, when the rubber hits the road, it gets nasty really quick. Sure. You know, and I've seen this specifically with Lordship Salvation. Yeah. And so, you know, when you start taking the perseverance of the saints of the P of Tulip, oh, you're not persevering in good works. Again, do I have a choice? Uh, you might not actually be one of the elect. Or sure. Arminianism, you need to get resaved. So that's that's like a downfall of the system. Because then you have people yeah. questioning their salvation based on their good works, and we're back at legalism all over again. But you know, it's interesting. I almost it's like, you know, with 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 the with many of the the legalistic legalism coming out of the out of uh, Judaism, the the legalism of Catholicism, and dare I say, the legalism of the Catholic or the some Reformed Christians, it's all the same. It's all man working his way to God. But we define it all different ways. Oh, do you have real faith? Well, the only way we know if you have real faith is if you're persevering in good works. So you're not doing, which just means that are you doing good works to have real faith? So it's weird. When it's saved by faith, you enter sanctification, the beam is judgment of Christ. You have rewards or the lack of rewards, but it has nothing to do with going to heaven. See how that changes the game? Because hmm. then it's like, God, I am saved and completely loved. And everything I do is on the basis of being well done, good and faithful servant, but not, oh, I'm taking your sonship away because sure. you uh, looked at pornography too many times for to make a very real example that I hear, you know, hear from other people too. It's like, yeah. you know, how much, and I read that, you know, especially with PLM and Pure Life Ministries and, and John Piper, you know, one of the top videos is, is, has my sexual sin made me unsavable? Why is that even a question? Was that a question for the woman at Sychar, the woman at the well who had five yeah. husbands? No. Did yeah. Jesus say, uh, well, you're going to need to clean up your life and then receive the Holy Spirit and believe in me? What? No, no, he didn't do that. Like, are we crazy? <laughs> like, like, yeah. like, like that. No, like, I, I, see amen. what I mean? Amen. Like, that's a big no, no. That's like a big, yeah. like, no, of course not. My sexual sin made me unsavable. Well, uh, a person with a real faith wouldn't be looking at pornography, wouldn't have cheated on their wife, wouldn't have. Are you kidding me? Have you read Corinthians? They're committing incest. Yeah, I know. That's disgusting. I know. It's just been going through it, that. It's disgusting, and and they're going to be stand before God. You know, they're and lose rewards. Corinthians but, one. Corinthians one. It says to the to the church to the saints. Uh, the saints I want to pull it up. Church. The saints of God in the church at yes. Corinth. Yes. Uh, but you see, but you'll see these who this, have been set apart. You know, they're set, set apart, apart and they're holy, and holy. like it's talking about this Walk church worthy. that's just an. S storm. It's just terror. Yes. It's in a really bad way. It's in not so a good many, thing. So many different ways. Sexual immorality, and then lawsuits against one another, and divisions of uh, even even uh, denominational divisions. I follow Paul. Apollos, I follow Apollos. Yeah. I follow Cephas. I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? No. Yeah. Just it was a mess. But they'll they'll go into those verses. People who are, for example, Lordship Salvation proponents, and they'll say those are false brothers, or those aren't you know real Christians, or whatever. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like, like it's not about oh yay, sin up a storm. I have fire insurance. Get it? Fire insurance. I don't get to go mm -hmm. to hell. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> jokes. Um, that's not the point. <laughs> it's not about fire insurance. It's about um, 
it's about, you know, you have a new nature. Oh man. So Daniel, he buys these, he buys great books. He bought something by Maximus, the confessor the other day. And I was going through it. Cause you know, this is the weird stuff we do, but um, you know, and he, he actually was talking about the one who sins is of the devil, that verse in, in first John. And this was used yeah. against me. See, Robert, you're of the devil. You have never known Christ. They will come to me and say, we did signs. What were you? And then he'll say, I never knew you be gone. Robert, that's you. You never knew him. Why? Because you, you know, you have sexual sin in your life. You know, you looked at pornography or whatever, you know, I'll give you that example. And so, you know, you aren't really saved. You never knew Christ. And so, you know, what Maximus the Confessor was saying, it was like, you know, it's like you've seen the sun and then you see the moon. It's like, you know what the sun is like, you know, this, it's like, it's like when you, the new spirit, the Holy Spirit is in you. It's like, you know, now, like God has put his himself in you and you know what good and bad is he, the spirit's convicting you. You have a new self that's regenerated. And and that's the point is sanctification is all about what and I, and like even in my own personal journey, I am saying no to the temptations to misuse my phone, my computer, whatever. I'm actually seeing victory over that because I'm acknowledging when I do something, oh my God, I chose to do that instead of this victimhood of Calvinism, which I labored under. You know, it was like, oh, when are you going to take this away from me? Oh, God, help me. Oh, do I have the power? No, I have the power. I have the choice. I always have. And guess what? You'll know the truth and truth will set you free. I knew the truth and it set me free. And guess what? My lies were not of naturalism. They were from the church. They were from, dare I say, the Calvinist reform group. I respect them. I believe they're saved. But guess what? You're telling people lies. Because yeah. when you apply your systematic theology to people struggling with sexual addiction, porn addiction, guess what? You, you, you're throwing the P of Calvinism at them, perseverance of the saints. They had an affair. You're telling them they're not really saved because they had an affair. I'm Excuse me. When did your works have anything to do with whether you're saved or not? Well, a true Christian. Are you kidding me? Hey, they will lose rewards at the beam of seat judgment of Christ. They are displeasing God. But guess what? Who, when did your works save you? When did your works get you in the door? When did your works, you know, it's, it has nothing. You're, you are saved unto good works, not saved by good works. You right. are saved to do good works. That's what Ephesians 1 exactly. talks about. Exactly. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. It says that. And yeah. James, honestly, can't forget James. Or you can only be show me, Show me your faith and I'll show you my works and vice versa. A man is justified by his works. I believe that's really talking about being justified before men. People know you're a Christian. Oh, because he is doing good. But then that gets into hypocrisy because someone said, once you set a standard, I, I think that was Beyond the Fundamentals, guys guy on YouTube, he was saying, once you set a standard of this is what a Christian looks like, then they won't actually start, or the flesh won't actually start letting the Holy Spirit direct them to that. They'll just start, you you know, striving to be that and lie yeah. about it, to be that standard. And it just becomes legalism. And that's exactly yeah. what happened at Pure Life Ministries was I was literally surrounded by people who started to conform to the Christian, who beat themselves up, who had a v- very low view of themselves. God was just, you know, ta- you know, taskmaster over them. Always, you know, you know, I, I always have my will crossed and I'm, o- I'm humble and now I'm this. And, and it was people conforming to this. And, you know, and then you'd yeah. hear and guys would come back to this program, you know, and they'd say, yeah, everyone I knew is back into sexual sin. You know, have they fallen away? You know, they've, they've backslidden. They're not saved anymore, you know? And so it's like, what, what, what? They're not saved. What? You know, it's like, when did, when did, uh, when did, save? They're not saved. What, what, what did they do to lose it? Like, is it, didn't Jesus pay at all? I mean, are we Catholic? Like what's going on? <laughs> like, I was like, it's just wild stuff, you know? And that's why you gotta, you know, rightly divide the word of truth. Was it second? Peter, Second Timothy, you know, three fifteen or I something. Remember. Off the top yeah, of it's head. rightly divide the word of truth, rightly teach the word of truth, so that you we might not stand. Do what does it say? So that we might not be ashamed. Literally standing before God. He's talking to Christians. I'm like, well, I stand ashamed before God because I mishandled the word of truth. You know, now God will wipe every tear away from our eye and every regret. But I sometimes wonder before He wipes those tears away. My pastor was saying, he's like, will there be regret? Like, wow, I was a Christian leader. And I messed up big time and I hurt thousands, millions of people with my theology. Will there be regret? Let and not she, many of you become teachers. It, it for beca- you, we will be judged to a stricter standard. And then I wonder, will Jesus come away and have to wipe away those tears? It says that, you know, in every tear, you know, there'll be no more pain. But I wonder, you know, it's like, will there be a moment of like deep regret where it's like, oh my goodness. My presentation of the gospel pushed that person into just a deep period of, of despair or, or or away from Christ for whom, you, you know, like the well, real ramifications. I mean, now, to, that God point, is moving. To, that, to that point, I think uh, 
I would temper it with there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So despite the fact that uh, someone might be teaching something incorrectly, they may be doing it inadvertently. Despite the fact yeah. that they're still doing it, you know, there are wolves in sheep's clothing and those that, need no, to be called saying. out I, and watched out for. I'm but, saying real but Christians like, though, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 I know what you mean. They're not but condemned, I, I was thinking but of, like the regret. No, I was thinking of this, uh, something along these lines the other day. Um, while I really strongly disagree with people like John Piper or MacArthur mm -hmm. or you know, MacArthur for numerous reasons, I, I think sure, he's yeah. a, a great speaker but i really disagree with a lot of what he has to say I know, tony told me the other day <laughs> um paul washer even you know i hear I, know, I, I hear them talk about sovereignty of god and i just like <sighs> gag you know but then when they talk about the testimonies of god working in their ministry to share the gospel and just like how he came through how god came through for yeah. these people yeah it's just amazing like it humbles me because i realize None of us have it totally right. Exactly. We all know yes. one part and yes. we prophesy in part. But when we see, when we are seen fully, we will know God fully Amen. and be known fully. And that's why I believe they're saved. It will all become not, clear. I'm but at the same time, but yeah. no, I know. But like, even if, even if they're doing something wrong, God's still at work. He's still at work. Amen. He's still working through all of us. There's these even when I say dumb stuff, yep. Messed up yep. creatures. Yep. Yeah. That, so, that, I don't yeah. know. No, that, that that's key. You know, again, being the body of Christ. And, and I think that, okay, before we kind of got off and got a little bit more, you know, heated about it, I think that was the point of the beginning of the video. It was like, I want people to understand us. Not agree. You don't have to agree. Oh, I don't agree with Andrew. Like, we have to go back. We're trying to go back and say, what is that, that piece of the puzzle that Robert and Andrew are, are looking at differently. And how might I disagree with that? Like they might say, well, I think you're looking at God's love in this way. And so that's where I disagree with you. And thus I can still be a Calvinist. Okay, fine. But at least try to understand our position. You know what I'm saying? Is there some cognitive dissonance that uh, needs to be worked be. out too? There could be cognitive dissonance, which is, you know, when, when it's a real thing, we it really is a real thing, truth and don't like it and just fight it, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, and and uh, you know what? I think I think we've been going for quite a while. But um, yeah, let's cut it. Yeah, I guess just in closing thoughts. I mean, that was we want people to just you know maybe see the bigger picture. Don't you know? You don't have to if you're a Calvinist, be a Calvinist, but just understand maybe okay, this is how people might misunderstand the the theology, or these are the shortcomings, or this is where the system is being uh, in in popular Christianity overemphasized. Maybe there is. Maybe there is a good balanced point, you know, between this Calvinistic thinking and then this hyper Arminian thinking. You know, what, you know, where have we gone since, you know, the 500, 400 years since the Synod of Dort, was it, you know, and, and all these discussions, you know, and, and yeah. how, and really, and really what I want to stress is how do our answers in the areas of sovereignty, Calvinism, how do they apply to us today? Because I tell you, when you have a, I was just hearing some horror stories, just awful things, you know, woman, you know, kid, <laughs> Good closing thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I just, I'm being real, you know, a woman who was kidnapped in her, her basement with her three kids around her taken and just abused and raped. And, you know, and literally, you know, two years ago around here, you know, and I'm like, what this kind of evil in a town out here, you know, where I am. And it's just like, what is go like that kind of evil exists? You know, did God elect that to happen? Was that a man's volitional sinful choice? You know, and it's like, you know, dealing with this suffering. And instead of us just seeing ourselves as the nail and God is the hammer, like I saw this, this, this meme, it's like, I am the nail. And, and these are the trials. And, and then the board is like, it says faith. And it says, God is, is it putting it, my, is it making my faith better. And it was like God hitting you with a hammer. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like that's it's a weak it, meme. Yeah, it was it was very awful. But I'm just saying, you know, when when we deal with suffering, can we have a better answer than? And, and I, I think this is what I was, was going to say this a while ago. But I, I did a class called the Theology of Suffering, and it really brought out that point of like we know a lot about the omnipotence of God, but how much do we know about His omnibenevolence? Again, Batman versus Superman. Lex Luthor asks that question. It's a it's a question that has plagued the minds of people for and still will you know you talk to the jews who survived the holocaust you know sure how could yeah. god have let this happen to us 
well, God is obviously all good, but he's not all powerful. And there's uh, some, you know, there's a, one of the leading rabbis that was one of the books he was, I forgot his name, but he wrote a book about it. It's like, God can't, he, he couldn't stop it, you know? And so you, these are important questions. So yeah, I don't, I think we end with more questions than we started with, but I hope that uh, this helped someone out there. And, you know, let's just, any closing thoughts, say, Andrew? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, um, What's key, what's really critical is digging into these things for yourself. Hmm. A lot of people love to reference second sources like commentaries or sermons or ask a pastor what his opinion on this is. I can understand the need and the incentive to do that when you come across a tricky passage. Those are those are not wrong to do. Hmm. But when you let a systematic shape how you read scripture – And so you ultimately read perspectives into scripture. There's a problem. Something's something's wrong. So dig into it yourself. I remember I didn't know about. Yeah, I mean, what's that passage? Um, You know and teach you because of the Holy Spirit. I I think about that a lot. First John. There's one in First John, and then in First Corinthians, we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of. We have the Spirit of God in us. I think it's First Corinthians. The spirit in the early chapter three, you understand everything. It says that in Timothy. Yeah, thing. we have. Who can so, understand I mean, the spirit of a man? Who can understand the mind of a man? But the spirit that is within him. We have the mind of God. We have the spirit of God in us, so we can understand the things of God. That hmm. means we can understand His revealed word yes. in Scripture, which He revealed, so we can understand it. Right. Ask in faith. I mean, I'm telling you guys, like, if you if you believe Scripture, believe that, and God will answer you. Like he will give you wisdom. He will give you insight. Don't trust man's doctrines, man's theology. Don't even trust us. Dig into this yourself. Amen. Yeah. Like the reason I have a problem with Calvinism as a whole is because I feel like I have tried to dig into it myself along with the Holy Spirit. And there's things that he highlights to me that I want to point out to other people. And I say, hey, what about this? What about that? And they're like, eh, God's sovereign. Eh, God elected them. Eh, God didn't elect them. That. That doesn't mesh with scripture. That doesn't mesh with what the Holy Spirit tells us. So research yeah. for yourself, dig for yourself, pray through these things because yeah. they're important and they really impact how you minister to believers and non-believers and what yeah. the ramifications and long-term ripple effects will be and to, for your yeah, ministries. You said to believers, yeah, just to especially discipleship, like when people have hard times, you know, maybe not you, but others and to respond with wisdom to them. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, let's let's uh, just close in prayer, I guess, and then we'll just, you know, we'll end it. So thank you, God, for another podcast. You know, we didn't really have a lot set up for this one. Um, you know, this is a platform. Show us truth. Show us where we err. Uh, we are mere, you know, we, we have the mind of Christ, but we need you to help us discern what you've revealed to us. Um, help everyone out there. I pray that, you know, we will just, uh, you know, show a balanced view of you, God, and, 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 and truth and, and your heart, and ultimately getting to the point of, like, we want people to have a, a love relationship with you, God, to walk closer to you, um, and to know that uh, you, you did everything for them to uh, spend eternity with them. Um, and so we thank you, God, uh, and just, yeah, bless everyone out there. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thanks for joining cool. us, guys. Uh <laughs> Well, I'm going to keep trying to upload more and more, but we'll we'll see how things go. Uh, but God bless everyone out there. Yeah. Bye-bye. Talk to you later.